My name is Rosie Batty. Last week, I lost a dear friend and colleague, Fiona Richardson. Fiona was Australia's first Minister for Family Violence Prevention. She was 50 years old. Fiona's courage and bravery is shared with you in an episode that went to air last year of her own family's experience of violence. With her family's blessing, we bring it to you again tonight. This is Fiona's story. My father was someone who was incredibly tall, over six foot. He went to boarding school in Scotland for a time, so he had a bit of a Sean Connery sound to his voice. And so when he told a story, and he loved to tell stories, it had that, I think, magical quality to it. He was um, a bit of a character, you know, he had um, oodles of charm and... Oh. The problem was, of course, that he wasn't like that all the time, uh, and when he was drunk, he was a very different man. Did you have a sense that you were special to him? Yes, one of the gifts that my father gave me was um, that he did love me. I've got to stop doing that. Why? sign of weakness in politics, you know that. And by the way, too, it's not a side of me that people have seen. The issue of domestic violence has come into very sharp focus here in Melbourne in recent weeks with a number of high profile killings of mothers and or their children. We have a new Premier in Daniel Andrews in Victoria and to his eternal credit he's elected or nominated that he wants to have a Royal Commission into Family Violence. A quiet Watsonia street has been rocked by the deaths of two children. It appears to be a tragic family violence incident. This really is the biggest law and order challenge that we face today. This crime is being investigated as an attempted murder. Two women a week killed by their current or former partner. Police aren't saying how the woman died. A leading cause of death and disability among women under the age of 45. A shocked community held a quiet vigil for the latest woman alleged to have died at the hands of her partner. When it came time to choose who would fulfil this role, who would be the leader in this field and deliver on all the commitments that we had made. And I thought Fiona's someone of great strength, someone who you know, only a couple of years earlier had, had beat breast cancer. It wasn't a long conversation. It didn't really need to be. I simply asked her to be Australia's first Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence, uh, Minister for Women as well. I wondered whether he knew he had some inkling or if someone had said something to him. I said to him, do you know anything about my family history? I had no knowledge, no sense that she had been a survivor of the very thing that I was asking her to be the minister for. And we both just couldn't believe it and it threw up all sorts of issues which she'd never really thought about. Of all the portfolios that she thought she might get, that was not one of them. I've, I've not um, spoken about it publicly. I um, called together a family conference, um, so Mum and my two brothers, and uh, I talked about the, you know, the position and the likelihood that perhaps something would come up uh, from our past. In the last 50 years, I think all of us, all the Richardsons, have pretty much kept in the past to ourselves. It, it brings back too many, too many memories, uh, too much pain, too much hurt, uh, too much sadness. We've all looked at this through very different eyes, you know, in different perspectives. So. She said, I want your permission to tell our story. 
Now, when you finally sort of pick your chin up off the floor and you put your Adam's apple back in your throat and you go, oh, gee, Willikers, hang on a second, here's something that we all have internalised. Most people would never have known that about our family. You know, it's not just my story, it's, you know, it's our story. And I said, well, the domestic violence was so bad, Fiona, that anything that comes out of that will be a nothing and people need to know because we survived it, we did. We don't have to do this. We, we, there's no obligation on us other than some greater civic duty if we choose to do it. My first reaction was terrified and I don't know that I want to have or comfortable about having my linen washed in public. So are you playing on Saturday? Where are you? If Hamish feels under pressure emotionally, he'll retreat into himself and he will even just say, I don't want to discuss this anymore, this is over. It's finished. Yeah, you've taken the soft option. Alistair came back um, pretty quickly and said, yes, you know, feel free. If it helps other people, then I would want you to use that story to, uh, you know, in the work that you do. Oh. And Hamish, I didn't hear anything from for some time. Come back. So I left it with him and resolved that I wouldn't talk about uh, anything to do with our childhood experiences until everyone was comfortable. And then he asked me to come and speak at an AGM that uh, he's connected to, and it was on family violence. She was making little notes on a little pad about what she's going to speak about, and so I just wrote, if you want to talk about our story and talk about me, that's fine with me, go ahead. It was, you know, one of those moments where you think, wow, you're telling me this now? Uh, so I did. I did. I, I've just made passing reference and obviously thanked him for that. Well, we came from Africa. So when we came from Africa, we brought domestic violence with us. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, as a child, Tanzania being a beautiful place. Like all kids, you always imagine it being bigger than it may be. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time at the beach. I haven't been back to Tanzania for 46 years. I don't want to go back there. And there is a reason. I just don't know what it is, but it's sitting in the back of my head. And that's scary. Two veggie hockey noodles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that Fiona's instigated all of this. Um, the family are finally talking to each other. No, it's and not fact bad. That you want to, but... Yeah, it's not bad. I guess I didn't quite anticipate the scale to which, you know, my brothers in particular would respond, and me as well, to what has happened in the past. I don't normally, you know, cry as often as I've been crying through, through the last little while, and I think, you know, it is about learning about what happened to them. It was awful. I was around six years of age. Hamish would have been eight, and my sister was probably about one. It was in our last home that we were in before we left Africa. My mother was in London. and She was having a hysterectomy. We'd been out with my father and a lady who I didn't really know at the time. My brother's on the telephone speaking to my mother. My mother said, you know, so how was your day? Just like a mother would. And then I said to Alistair, and what's Fiona doing? And Alistair said, she's sitting on Sybil's lap. Sybil was my husband, Richie's secretary. And as soon as that name came out, bang. And Alistair hit the floor like a bag of spuds. He was then removed. He was removed upstairs, kicking and screaming into the room. And that's when he, um, he hit me. Um, and I remember the first, the first punch, which was to the face, um, and I can't recall anything from there. And there's nothing I can do. What can I do? I'm this big. There's nothing I can do. What did you think of your father at that moment? I couldn't stand him. I hated him. With a passion. How long did that hatred last? Forever. It's never left. 
My mum and I, we're incredibly close. Uh, you know, she lives with me and uh, we've always been partners in crime, if you like. But sometimes I find it very hard to reconcile the woman that I know as this formidable, strong, you know, intelligent, passionate woman with the woman that she was when she was with my father. So it's obviously in Dar es Salaam. Yeah. I shall never be able to describe how I love you. Oh, well, well, ain't that the truth? He'd say that to me after he'd beaten me or something. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a lot of anxious moments between her and her mum in the last few weeks about, what about this story? And I haven't heard that one before. And, you know, how does this work? And, oh, but you didn't tell me about that. I tried to understand why I had put up with being beaten by my husband for so many years. And then I sort of th I sort of said to myself, well, it's because your mother was violent. I thought being beaten was normal because my mother always beat me. Then I began to think, well, where does she come from? What's my background? My mother was born in Vereniken in South Africa grew up mostly in East African countries, but uh, the start of her life was in, in South Africa. And uh, my grandmother um, and her propensity to, to move constantly, gypsy-like, uh, around Africa meant that my mother didn't really have a stable base or stable home for much of her childhood. Richie was a very persuasive, charismatic fellow. I was very needy for his support. I always thought that I couldn't survive without him. And that was something that I got from my mother who always said, you have to have a man in your life. I've never really had an interest in going back to Tanzania because there was just nothing there for me. And now I think it's important to go just to hear from my own personal side, my mother's version of events. I feel that Hamish is, he wants some answers to things now. He wants to know how they've all evolved to be who they are, how they've all survived and become who they are. There's the plan at the moment that we go up to Tanzania and, and have a check around, and then Fiona's going to follow later. Hamish is surprising me along this journey. I never actually thought he was going to go to Tanzania and he actually stated he wouldn't be going. I think he's now he's starting to relive some of the past. Born in Dar es Salaam. When I was 10, I went to live in Australia. Born in Virinigan. Born in Dar es Salaam. And we used to camp on the beaches, and you'd camp in a coconut tree house, and you'd camp on the beach for the night. This, this is this is the cemetery. Am I right, Kinondoni Cemetery? I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure this is where Dad is buried. When I was around 14, I went to Dar es Salaam to meet up with my mother and I was introduced to Bert Richardson, who I was told was going to be my father and I should call him Dad. About 18 months or so later, Dad uh, had a knock at the door and his son Richie arrived with his wife and two kids. Richie was the same age as my mother and um, he was 20 years older than me. My grandmother, you can only describe her life as somewhat colourful. Uh, she had a great many husbands, five, uh, officially. It became clear in time that perhaps the relationship between my father and my grandmother was somewhat complicated and more in intimate than um, my mother obviously knew at the time. Richie was very um, kind to me and he took a great interest in me and I was allowed to spend time with him and I wasn't allowed to spend time with anybody else. He started to, to groom me and ultimately he took my virginity. 
How old were you at that stage? 14. And where was his wife at that stage? Where were his children at that stage? They were in Dar es Salaam. They lived about mm, maybe half a mile away from where we lived. Bertie, there you go. I told you I'd find it. Standing at my grandfather's grave, Bert, it doesn't make sense to me as to why my father was violent when Bert Richardson was such a gentle person. I guess in a way, if you're looking for an explanation or a reason why Dad made the choices he made, you don't find them here. You know, he was... he was a good man. I actually left home when I was about 15. It was a hotel where they took in people, you know, and it was on a monthly basis. You had all your meals and uh, that's where I went. I was 19 when Hamish was born. Richie was still married to his, his wife, and I fell pregnant with Alistair. Richie did not want me to have that child, and he insisted that I have an abortion. And I said, no, I wouldn't have an abortion. There was one occasion when there was this man, and he asked if he could dance with me, and we danced. Richie was furious. I knew I was in for big trouble. Richie beat me, he raped me, he sodomized me, he did everything to humiliate me. And it was something that I didn't... It was horrible, it was horrible. Yeah. And Veronica, did you think of leaving? No. Why? Well... A woman in Africa on your own with two children, you, you really are, you're stuck. My parents married in a registry office in Dar es Salaam soon after my father was divorced from his first wife. My marriage was, um, I don't know when it was, 19, uh, about 19... Six, 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 six. Yes. That, that's me, my husband, and his brother. I left work for half an hour. That's what I was given, half an hour. Chair asked obviously over here, got married, and then went back to work. And there was no, there was no sort of, I don't know, there was, it, it just didn't mean anything to me. But it did mean that my two boys were legitimised. And that was the reason why I did it. And I don't regret that. Having seen it and, you know, the officers, it, it just feels to me like, you know, a sordid kind of affair. You know, it just, it just felt wrong uh, to be marrying in that way. I stayed with, with your dad for long enough for us to have you, and for that I'm eternally, eternally grateful. Yeah, and you. <laughs> Fiona being the little one and being a girl, Richie adored her. He gave in to her every will. He absolutely adored her. And she adored him too. Richie actually got promotion. We moved from where we lived in Kurizini to a much bigger house. Still in Dar es Salaam, but right on the ocean. Oh, we had arrived. <laughs> yes, we had arrived. That's the house there? Yeah, yeah, the gate's there. Oh. oh. Yes. Yep. Yes, that's, that's the that, house. Yes. Jeez, it looks a bit run down. It hasn't really well been looked after well. Come on, Maasai. Yeah, yeah. Maasai, Maasai. Yeah. I thought you were Maasai. I thought you were Maasai. I'll do that now. Oh. If you come along here, we walk in, we park in here. There's the front door. This is the lounge room. It was one of the best houses in Dar es Salaam. Not the top, but a very good house. It was beautiful. And it just seems to have deteriorated everywhere. Yeah, such a shame. Do you know that it's about to come down? Really? Yeah, in three weeks' time. You're so lucky that you found this building standing. They're going to pull it down in three weeks' time. You're joking. Jesus, we just got here.
At first I thought, well, that's a sad moment in time, but then I thought, no, just get rid of it, burn it to the ground, you know, start afresh. Uh, you know, Tanzania is starting afresh. And this house, it's, it's time for this house to go as well. You know, seeing the stairs, watching Hamish recount the story of a particularly nasty beating that my brother Alistair got, it was tough to be there. You know, I'd, I'd heard the story before, but when you're there, it's just horrible. I was a great believer in the independence of the African countries. And I said to Richie, you know, we white people have to get out. We have to let the Africans develop their own countries. We've got to get out. My father wanted to go to South Africa, but my mother was vehemently opposed uh, to all things apartheid. So we ended up in Sydney, and unfortunately, things went back to how they were in Africa. I'm now gone from being an innocent bystander to actually taking up arms, for want of a better way of describing it, and trying to put myself between him and her, my brother and sister. And what did you do? Beat the shit out of him. That's what I did. What with? <laughs> Big stick. And that wasn't an easy thing to do. What did it feel yeah, like? Yeah, it was easy. No, that was easy. The physical process was difficult because he kept moving. They move. Cowards move. Anyway. What upsets me is being put in that position. Hamish and I um, came back from school one afternoon as we approached my mother's car, it looked fuller uh, and busier than it normally would. My mother was there and she said to my brother and I that she was leaving, that we could either stay here with my father or we could leave with her, but she was leaving there and then. And um, then I came to Melbourne and we stayed in refuge homes. My mother had tried to leave a number of times, so I think in my head I was always hoping it was going to happen. But you never lose that sense of when could your father turn up, when could things escalate, when could he discover that we're here. Not long after my mother separating from my father, she formed a relationship with Tony Power, um, who then became obviously my, my stepfather. And she repeated the pattern and I guess was the lived statistic that I know now of again forming a relationship with an alcoholic. And I remember thinking at the time that uh, a sense of helplessness because I thought we're back in that situation again, I'm reliving what I thought I'd left um, and being a lot older, uh, a, sense, a real sense of frustration that this could ever happen again. Did it make you angry with your mother? Um, no, I actually felt sad. I felt sad for my mum. When my mother finally divorced my stepfather, it was with an enormous sense of relief because I felt not only was she being released from that rather destructive relationship, but, but so was I. By my sister becoming the minister, we've actually started to discuss it. So the fact is that probably that discussion wouldn't have happened had it not been for the minister, and probably that discussion should have been had regardless of whether she was the minister. The first thing I found out when I went to university was that violence follows in through the families. But when Hamish got married, there's no violence there. Alistair got married, there's no violence there. Fiona got married, there's no violence there. So it seems like it's almost like it's stopped. 
I found out where I've come from. The demons have sort of kind of been put to bed and um, uh, I, I feel like I can move on now. Order! As today is the day to make a pledge for women, and given that my mum is in the public gallery today, <laughs> and that we are just three weeks away <laughs> from receiving the most significant report into violence against women, today I make this pledge. A pledge for women, and importantly also for children. We will put victims at the centre of our response, something that has never happened before. When I went to the Magistrates Court and I saw a victim of family violence seeking an interim intervention order that was in fact uncontested, being cross-examined in the witness box by a magistrate, it occurred to me at that point in time that if you actually set out to design a system most likely to fail in resolving family conflicts, you would design a system that we have, the traditional justice model. I think there are many that are quick to blame magistrates are quick to blame lots of different parts of this system. But the real failure is on the part of government. We've not joined up those services. We've not properly supported them to, to do better. Hello. Nice to see you. Come on through. So with this new intervention order, is he still breaching that one? Or? So this is the phone room that we respond to all of the women and children who make contact across the state. So what if we were to accommodate you back and into that motel and then I might try and get you into some supported accommodation? So we have one worker overnight. One worker. Which is when you get for the whole state. So are you, any, are you on any form of income from Centrelink? Can it be said, do you think that you're too close to the whole issue of family violence to be able to watch over this portfolio objectively? There's no doubt trawling through the past is very challenging for me and also incredibly sad. But it has given me this unique insight into victims of family violence, particularly childhood victims of family violence who are so often lost in our response uh, to, to family violence. No matter what the Royal Commission uh, determines, we're going to do a range of things, including a first for Australia. We're going to have uh, a Family Violence uh, Victims Advisory Council because ultimately we know that is the only way we're going to keep uh, politicians, judges, police, all of us, in fact, honest. What were the highlights to the trip? Hamish was going around pressing the, the flesh everywhere, weren't you? <clears throat> oh, good fun. And he was really enjoying himself. You should, you should come also, next time. The journey with Mum and my brothers in, in talking about what has happened in the past has been valuable, no doubt. And causing people that you love unhappiness is clearly what you don't want to do in life. So it's been tough watching, watching them. Uh, be sad through this process, but also, you know, I've seen I've seen some doors open, but also some doors effectively close, and that can only be a good thing. For information or support on issues raised in this program, please contact one of these services. Family Violence Counselling Service, 1800 737 732. Lifeline, 13 11 14. Men's Referral Service, 1300 766 49.